my most viral guest of all time is back. Dr. Patrick Flynn is a chiropractor and clinician known as the Hormone Whisperer, who is working towards a global health revolution. He founded The Wellness Way, a network of more than 80 health restoration clinics that think and act differently to solve health challenges that others can't. If you have debilitating PCOS, can't get more than four hours of sleep a night, are struggling with cystic acne, thinning hair, or chronic fatigue, you likely have a hormonal imbalance. This is where Dr. Flynn really shines. In our first interview, he talked about the hormonal differences between men and women last July, and that if you understand how the opposite sex thinks and feels hormonally, it can set your relationship up for long-term success. This week, we're uncovering how to know if you have a hormonal imbalance, what it means to get your hormones tested, what different deficiencies can mean, what to do about it, what to look for in supplements, and how to do all of this in the first place. And guess what? I did it. I did my first ever intensive blood and hormone test to see what, if anything, is going on with me. This is a fully transparent, real life doctor's appointment for me that you get to listen in on, as well as get tons of advice for yourself so you can do it too. If you didn't know, The Spillover is produced by Turning Point USA, a nonprofit. To support the show financially, help pay for guest travel, equipment, and set needs, make a tax deductible donation at the link in the description. Pause, watch this episode with a loved one by subscribing to Real Alex Clark on YouTube for the video. And by the way, when was the last time you left a five-star review? Help us grow. Tell me what the show is meant to you so other prospective listeners can see what we're all about. Please welcome international speaker and best-selling author, Dr. Patrick Flynn, back on The Spillover. Dr. Flynn, the last time that you were here, we focused on how to understand the hormonal difference between men and women. Yeah. The episode went mega viral. Mm-hmm. Were you surprised by the response that it got? Um Yes and no. I think I've been doing this for so long and uh, seeing how women are so sick today that when they get some understanding about what's really going on and have some answers that they've never had before, I think it's just easy to share a message like that. And then we try to make it really simple. And so therefore, then they can communicate. And then I, I, I've, I've gotten thousands of messages since the last episode. So it's excited to do what we're going to do today. Well, I think a lot of those women were listening and sending it to their husbands. Mm-hmm. And they were, because they loved yep. your whole thing about like, your man needs to understand how yep. your hormones work. Your relationship will flourish. It will be better off. And uh, actually, that was the episode that introduced a lot of men to my podcast. And now I have a lot more male listeners. Great. Well, I know, I remember, I know there's there was women making videos out there saying, I listen to this podcast. And my husband listens to it. And he treats me better now. <laughs> I was like, that was fantastic. And look at us. Mm-hmm. Look at us. Yep. So is hormonal a bad word? Um, I think if it's taken out of context, it's like if you're saying like a woman is sensitive, that if you, guess what? They're supposed to be sensitive. So if we don't understand about women, we think it's bad. So being hormonal is a great thing. And because you, you don't want hormones to be off. So, and there's changes that happen with women all the time in hormones. So hormonal is a great thing. I want to know everything about getting your hormones tested. Yep. How do you do it? And what does it tell you? Well, we have to step back and look at what where women have been misled. The biggest thing that uh, that I started 25 years ago was really simple. And obviously, most people know my wife's story now. Is She was very sick. She suffered from endometriosis. And that's very common to have a very dominant estrogens that exist there. Well, when I started to look at her labs that her physicians were doing, they were dramatically incomplete. Now, what do I mean? You know, when I, when I talk about hormones, I usually start and say, okay, listen, if you're dating a man or married a man, uh, the major hormone that makes him who he is is testosterone. Everybody, everybody knows that. It's a simple hormone. There's testosterone free. It's it's quite well known. But here's the one thing. Well, the woman, when she looks at the hormones that make her who she is, um, women don't understand that's estrogen. But then I started to say, okay, listen, ladies, do you understand estrogen is not a hormone? And that's where women go, wait, what are you talking about? Well, estrogen really is a term that represents many hormones. And then I ask women, have you had all of them measured? And just that simple phrase right there is going, number one, they didn't know that it's a term that describes many and then have never had them fully tested um, because once again, our current system is looking to measure just one or two. And I just can't, I just don't believe that's right. I, I believe the fact that if, if these things can dictate you both mentally and physically, and we're taking a little small snapshot of it, um, you're just having such an incomplete view of it. So therefore, I just started calling lab companies and said, can we do this? And no joke, the response was, yes, why? And insurance doesn't pay for it. And I was like, but I have a very sick woman that I want to marry and she has endometriosis. So we did it obviously. And, and then we started to test that way a long time ago. And, and it's, um, it actually really started to answer some questions for people clinically. And then doctors of all kinds started calling me going, Hey, what are you doing? And I started showing them and, and just kind of exploded just like our, our message last time. 
You said there's multiple estrogen hormones that need to be tested. How many? Well, standardly, you at least want to get 10 of them measured. You know 10 of them? Yes. So, yeah. And, and that's the thing, because most women think of like, you know, estradiol, which is the major component for cyclic women. And if you're menopausal, estrone. And that's what Christy had measured. As a cyclic young lady at 23 years old, she had done many times, estradiol is measured. And what really threw them off was it was normal. And when you look at the condition of endometriosis, usually you usually have higher levels of estrogens. And um, of course, they said, well, obviously, then it has to be genetic because the one marker we measured wasn't off. So therefore, everything has to be normal. And that is very common when women ask even test their thyroid today. And so we just said, OK, listen, you got to get them all tested. But what really was important to me was sharing the message going, hey, listen, you need both blood and urine done together. Because if you just do one or the other, once again, the, the testing to me is very incomplete. Who needs to be getting their hormones tested? Just women or men too? Well, what I want you to do is this. Um, can you hold your two fingers up like this? I'll put it against your neck. If you feel a pulse, you have to get measured. <laughs> 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 so that means basically everybody. Because I, here's one thing that we talked about last time. They affect you both physically and mentally. And if we look at the current healthcare system today, most people are having a lot of physical and mental problems that are hormonally related. And so I just tell people, just get a picture because these can be some contributing factors, them being abnormal. And actually, if they're not normal, it, there's such things that can be devastating, everything from just mental illness to breast cancer, to prostate problems, to every condition on the planet. Should somebody get their hormones tested even if they're not experiencing any abnormal symptoms? Well, what I always do is this, is uh, most people know now I have four daughters and my daughters have been labs done since they were little. Now, once again, and that's why a lot of people don't do those things because what they'll do is they say, well, insurance doesn't pay for it. I'm like, I don't care. I'll just pay for it anyways. But the idea is this, is because here's what happens. You can catch things way early. It's like when a person has their thyroid tests and their, anti, uh, their um, antibodies come back very high. But guess what happens? You caught it way before something happens to where it starts to go down. You can catch all these hormonal problems very early and start to actually make the positive changes. So actually they never turn out to be bad. See, I was going to ask you that. How early should you start getting your hormones tested? Like, should you be testing your children? Do you wait till you're in your teens, yeah. 20s? Well, I have a standard rule. Like I said, there's, you know, just as my personal bias is having daughters myself, I started testing about 10 years old and before they were cyclic. And then what it did, it just allowed me to keep them in decent ranges that way that they weren't starting to elevate too early. And so therefore, you know, we want to make sure that the things and then they, they've they transitioned. I've, I have only two cyclic girls and stuff because I still have a 14-year-old and a 10-year-old. So I figured in the next couple of years, they'll be hitting their cycle and stuff. So I started at 10 years old for all my daughters and had them measured every single year. And um, and then then because their hormones were normal, they never experienced things like PMS and all the problems that other young ladies do. Why should somebody get their labs done with a doctor like you versus their standard clinician yeah. or standard physician? I think you should get them done no matter who will do them as long as they're complete. For example, you know, like we did last time, I said, hey, listen, here's just a sheet of blood work that can be done. It's posted on our website. Any doctor can do it. It's just that the majority of them don't because, number one, they don't know what to do with them when they get the results back. Number two, they have to try to justify the insurance of why they want to have them done. Because remember, our current healthcare system is always looking for every disease in the planet. And most young people don't present too many things as far as disease processes. So they have to have some justification to do them instead of just trying to stay healthy and look and make sure that nothing's thrown off. So the idea is, I, I believe that anybody can do it. it. They can. It doesn't matter as long as it, and actually on top of it, you don't even need a doctor to have it done. You can legitimately go to a lab and get them done and don't need a doctor whatsoever. It's just that our current form of healthcare kind of has made themselves the gatekeeper. And so people just say, well, my doctor won't do it. Well, then do it on your own. Well, and, and really what it comes down to, they're just a gatekeeper to insurance. Well, and also, I mean, I have the same experience. It's intimidating. I don't know how to understand what these results say, you know. So it's nice to have somebody like you or a doctor. I think that's where people get freaked out when you're like, well, you can do it yourself. But OK, but I, I mean, yeah. I don't understand that stuff. Yeah, you still need a person guiding you. and uh, But that's the thing. And the reason why the majority of conventional doctors will not do them is because they don't know what to do with them. And it's been said to, to thousands of our patients that we get the labs back. And um, and there's not one marker you can't look up yourself. It's just that in, when you look at most things that when people say, why don't doctors handle these? If they don't have a form of treatment for them, they're not going to do them. What can hormone testing tell you? It can tell you so many things. Let's start here. There's physical and psychological things that are affected by the whole hormonal system. And um, so therefore, it can even predict what's going to happen to you in the future as far as certain cancers and stuff. So it's uh, 
it's it's a, such a wide variety of things because it's almost like a blanket picture because if you really look at hormone stands for, it stands for message. That's what a hormone is, just a messenger. So therefore, it kind of gives you an idea of what's going on and how your body's talking to itself and the confined problems that you didn't even really know existed. Do you do the same labs for every single client? It's kind of the same, um, just because, you know, let's say a person comes in with, um, let's say endometriosis or PCOS, there will be a little bit more dominant hormones with PCOS compared to endometriosis. You're going to have more androgens, more testosterone dominant with something like PCOS. Yet endometriosis, you're going to have a little bit more of the estrogens that are elevated, but you still want to know all of them because they do convert into other forms. And on top of it, it could have stemmed from something else that was there. So having a picture of the androgens compared to the estrogens, guess what happens? It's going to be a wonderful picture to see what's going on. And therefore, it's going to you know, be able to give you a picture of some of their past and also a really big predictor of what's going to happen in the future. But there are all, also all of these, there's these different things I hear about. Like yep. there's blood testing, yep. there's a gut microbiome mm -hmm. test, sure. and then some stool test, or is that the same? Um, and then Dutch test, like all these different yeah. things. Well, those are dramatically different labs. Do you like some of those more than others, I guess, is what I'm wondering. Depends what the person comes in with. Okay. You know, saying okay. what they present with. And on top of it, you might start with one lab and the body will be saying, okay, this is what's going on. For example, um, if you do have an autoimmune process, uh, there is some immune trigger. So you might have to do additional tests once you get some hormonal testing done because hormones can actually direct you a little bit of like some of the areas of the body that are majorly off. So you couldn't, you can find out sometimes there's immune problems from t hormonal testing. And therefore, okay, then you can do a little bit more dig or deep on it. Now, to be clear, mm -hmm. and I may be wrong on this, you don't diagnose people, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So you can look, though, at patterns in somebody's hormonal testings and kind of, along with knowing their health history, help them get on the right path with their hormones. So explain, yep. like, your process and what you do. Most people present into our offices because they have some condition. They really do. They have some diagnosis. And they have, usually have failed care. They've progressively get worse. Their doctor's not giving answers. They're frustrated. And then we go, okay, listen, so let's just pick PCOS because right now it's become a very dominant condition that roughly 10% of women across the world suffer from right now. Now, what that does now, well, you understand that there's going to be certain hormones that are dominant, so you're going to run those labs on there. And then what's going to do, you're going to see them and go, okay, listen, you already got a diagnosis of PCOS based on all your, your presentation to your doctors that way. But you got to remember, it's about finding out the hormones that are really being the major factor that are dictating and driving that. And then some of the lifestyle things that are even driving that even more. And then you start to reverse those. And then here's the great thing. I think I mentioned to you not too long ago, um, people are always excited about testing. Uh, and I love testing. I think it's one of the greatest things. But I think retesting is even better because not only do you see the progress in the person as they present, if they present with PCOS, and then you start to see it starting to work backwards and start to go normal. And then they're, the patient's extremely excited because they'll go get another ultrasound. They'll go get some other testing done by their docs that they've been seeing for a long period of time. And then I'm excited about that change, but I'm like, hey, listen, nice seeing that pathology change, but I want to see how labs go back to normal. Why do we always see people get told by their primary care doctors, there's nothing wrong with you. I don't see anything. But the patient is saying, I know something is wrong with me. Then they go see a doctor like you and you're like, yeah, something is wrong. Where's the yeah. disconnect? How come they're not finding what you are? But it's, it's really not a disconnect. Um, it's actually a very good thing. A lot of people come into our offices very frustrated. I mean, like really frustrated. And I'm like, no, no, no. Go back and thank your doctor. And they're like, what do you mean thank your doctor? I said, I want you to think about this. If you look at what, if we, if we can understand what I do and what, you know, basically our current form of healthcare does. And I gave the example and you read it in my book. You know, I always tell people, you know, medicine's like the fire department. You know, if house catches on fire, guess what happens? Let's call that disease. Let's say that could be cancer, it could be heart disease, something that your house is going to burn down. Just think, um, they're going to use their, the fire department, the axes and hoses to put out. Now we know that when they do that process, there could be destruction through the process, but they're really saving house. Now people are left with a burnt up house. Well, we're the kind of people that say, listen, we need to rebuild the house. So when somebody goes into a doctor, they're going to look for that fire. Okay. And so the people go, so the doctor is doing a wonderful job with all the technology. They're looking for all these pathologies and they ain't present yet. Mm -hmm. they don't, they're just not, they're not present in their body. Yet those things happen to take years and years to develop. For example, I just posted some, a pretty good research article where they even talk about type 2 diabetes. You're, you will have hyperinsulinemia for 10 to 15 years before that'll even present that they'll record it as. So you couldn't even get the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes for a long period of time. And that's why when I first graduated 25 years ago, type 2 diabetes was called adult onset. And obviously it's migrated back lower and lower into teenage years now, so they had to change that. But the idea is 
diseases take such a long time to develop that by the time that they catch them, you understand you've been sick for a long period of time. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're just seeing the normal state of where the body's at. And if it's abnormal, guess what's going to happen? It's like this, you know, if all of a sudden, you know, like when I left Green Bay this morning, it was really cold. You know, if you decide to walk outside, you know, in a swimsuit during that time, your body's going to go into a fight or flight response. Um, now there's no pathology relevant that's there. You don't say any disease, but guess what happens? Everything from your blood sugar to your blood pressure to your, you know, um, cortisol levels and everything will change. And we'll look at a person and say, listen, got to get that change now because eventually it's going to lead to something bad. It could even lead, lead to something that blood pressure stays high for a long period of time to a stroke. But see, they don't do that. So it's just about checking those markers. They check for pathology. We're just making sure all the things, all the biochemistry and physiology is normal. Why is it important to understand that what is normal to somebody may not necessarily mean optimal when it comes to health? Well, they're kind of the same. They really are. Because, you know, for example, if you look at ranges for most hormone labs, they're within them. It's just that what happens this. You can you can have a marker and let's say your thyroid can run from one to five. Well, guess what happens? Someone could be at a three, and even though it's in their normal range, but they might be better off two. And so as they start to get their body back to normal, it starts going to two or 1.5. And then you can, then after measuring that for several years, you can start to tell, okay, what's more optimum for that person. Have you heard that 80% of people are pre-diabetic and have no idea? Yes, yes. Um, and I would say that's probably on low end. <laughs> are you serious? Yeah, because once again, we, we remember we live in that fire department, pathological end stage, wait till you fall apart kind of healthcare. And then people, once again, it takes years and years to develop that way. It really does. And that's why if you ever look at the lab that we ran, we ran on well, the hormone test, you want to run a fast, fasting insulin. That can be elevated for many, many, many years before there is any diabetic diagnosis. What are the most common hormonal problems that you see in people that have PCOS, infertility, or even premenopausal symptoms? Uh, quite simple. Estrogens, testosterone, progesterone levels are off significantly. and um, and because, you know, women, the best thing they have for younger women is a form of birth control, which is a whole nother topic. Um, but the idea is this, is they try to do some hormone therapy. And you can, and because hormones fluctuate so much, trying to give a person the same dose all the time actually makes no clinical sense. When I bring up the birth control conversation, mm -hmm. the one person without a doubt who yep. always ends up in my DMs yep. is the person who is adamant. I understand what you're saying and I understand birth control should be a last resort, but there are people with endometriosis. This is our only option. This is the only thing that helps us. What is your response? Well, it's the only option that you've talked to those kind of doctors about. You know, say, and it's like, and so therefore they've given you an option. It's, it's, it's like when, when you go to, to some practitioner and said, this is the only thing you do. I'm like, well, no, it's the only thing that you can do through you. Mm -hmm. You know, say, because I would tell people if I'm so wrong, which I'm not, but if I'm so wrong, why am I so busy? So then, so. <laughs> and be honestly, why, why have I, why have I started one clinic? And now, like I said, we have them all over the world. So if somebody is telling, being told by their physician yep. that uh, for endometriosis, the only thing that's going to work for you is birth control, what is going on with them and their endometriosis? Why is the doctor saying birth control? Well, because once again, think of it this way. It's an endocrine disruptor. It can change your estrogens quite easily. It really can. It can inhibit them. You can actually see this in labs. It drops the, the estrogens quite well. It does. So therefore, if you lower the estrogens, you're going to have less growth and you're not going to actually suffer as you would if you weren't on birth control. But it doesn't get you back to normal. And actually it creates a whole other host of problems. And on top of it, you're gonna have other hormone problems that are disrupted from taking birth control in the first place. So that's why that's why it's kind of interesting. You're, you're passing off a little bit of slowing down on a condition to create other conditions because that's why we see other side effects besides just, let's say, endocrine problems that go there because it also relates to neurological problems and digestive problems. I mean, I mean birth control itself affects how well your stomach uh, releases hydrochloric acid. So it causes not only digestive problems. That's why there's a whole host of negative side effects that, you know, go through all the systems. What would your recommendation be for somebody then that is in a severe endometriosis situation if it if it isn't birth control? Well, here's what it's going to sound very surprising. Um, and endometriosis was one of the major things with fertility that I took care of for, for all these years. Because that's what your wife had. Yes, because that story was shared. And then what happens is this, obviously, um, then I can show all the labs and everything that's needed that way. and. I can honestly tell you, not one person has ever in 25 years in all the offices and thousands of doctors, I've never seen anybody come in with endometriosis or any major condition and ever have their hormones tested properly. So that's always a start. 
See, so that's why when women may say, hey, there's nothing I can do. My doctor said, I'm like, okay, let me see your labs. And therefore I'm going, all right, well, here, watch this. So if you, so someone's going to DM you and say, birth control is the only thing I can do for endometriosis. Well, I'll say, let me say, that, let me see your blood work and your urine work together. And what do you think most women are going to say? Oh, I didn't do that. Thank you. So your testing is incomplete. It dramatically is incomplete. So therefore, how can you, you know, want to argue with us or want to talk about that way when I'm going, hey, listen, these are labs that they're all medical labs. They're not like it's a specialized lab or something like that. Any doctor can do them. It's just they don't do them because once again, there's no course of action to change them. And so what is it that helps endometriosis if it's not birth control? I mean, is it yep. certain supplements that you usually go to or what? Well, here's what happens. If you look at, you have to look at hormones in two ways. There's production and there's conversion and there's elimination. So most women in the just sphere of endometriosis, they will have higher estrogen levels because they can't metabolize and break them out. But that's more of a liver issue. And so, they're, so they don't realize that they're having problems with phase one and sometimes phase two of the liver. So therefore, if they're not broken down and changed, they're going to just recirculate. So then there's still a production of the egg being stimulated, more estrogen's coming out. And then women say, I'm estrogen dominant. So I have all these things. I'm like, um, your body's going to still produce the estrogens need to. It's just that what's going to happen now is the fact that you, because you can't clear them out and metabolize them, they're just going to recirculate. So they're just going to keep on building up. It, it, it's like, like I always tell people, it's like having a tub with seven drains. And let's say only two of them are working. Well, if you keep the same amount coming in for seven drains, eventually it's going to overflow. Let's get real about the everyday challenges of not just finding meals that taste good, but also ensuring they keep us on the path to a healthy lifestyle. Every time I stroll down those grocery store aisles, I feel like it's a struggle to find foods that really align with my health goals. So I decided to stop settling for subpar options and switch to Good Ranchers for all my meat shopping. And let me tell you, it is the best decision I've ever made. Good Ranchers makes cooking and grocery shopping less of a mundane task and more of an exciting opportunity to craft meals that contribute to your overall well-being and your families. My favorite product of theirs is their pre-trimmed chicken breasts. Not only does their chicken have no antibiotics ever, but it also has no hormones, no vaccines either. And right now, you can get $189 of their chicken completely free. You see... Good Ranchers was running this fantastic New Year New Meat offer where they were giving away free chicken for a year, but that offer expired on January 31st. For everyone but conservatives! Yes, really, this is an exclusive offer for my listeners only, and you won't find it anywhere else. Not on the Good Ranchers website, not in any ordinary promotion, only right here on The Spillover. To redeem this offer, subscribe to any of their boxes and then use my code CLARK at checkout. That way, Good Ranchers will take $20 off that box and then add two and a half pounds of free chicken breast to every order you receive for the next year. That's over two and a half pounds. Well, total 25 pounds of free pre-trimmed chicken breast for a year. Go to GoodRanchers.com with code Clark for $20 off and free chicken for a year. And with Good Ranchers, you're not just getting top-notch free chicken. You're getting peace of mind knowing it's sourced from American farms. Elevate your meals with Good Ranchers today because you deserve America's best. Find everything in the description below. Good Ranchers, American meat delivered. How do you know if you're always tired because you're just getting older or because there's something hormonally wrong? This is going to surprise people. You're not supposed to get tired like that. Really? No. Oh, I'm so messed up. Well, and, <laughs> and that, now, now remember, now understand, now understand this though. A woman is different than a menopausal woman, which is different than a male. Um, I'm 49 years old and I go 100 miles an hour a single day. Okay. Oh, I know that. <laughs> I, I know you. <laughs> and, but the idea is this, and because I have testosterone levels at 851, I do all things that way, the way I eat, everything like that. But here's the point with a woman during the, like we talked about last time, there's really four stages to a woman's cycle. You know, they have week one, week two, week three, four, and there's times by nature, energy is going to be a little bit low and women that are cyclic, if they don't understand that, they think there's something wrong because they don't realize that fact that you know, there's, there's a greater state of repair during sometimes there's times that that stress can affect you a lot greater. There's times that once again, everything from digestion changes everything. And so therefore they think there's something wrong. I'm like, no, what area your cycle are you on? And that's a big thing. So now, Drum, and as a woman moves into the menopausal ages, um, it's easier to keep more stability. It really is because they don't have the big fluctuations like cycling. Women so what if you're chronically fatigued? You're just always tired. That's I mean, not, outside of no, the... That's, that's not normal. Okay. That's not normal. No, there, there's, there, there can be everything from adrenal problems to estrogen problems and progesterone problems. All those contribute dramatically. What should women specifically ask for when getting their hormones tested? It's really simple. They need to look at two things. 
they need to be able to, if they just start this in their own investigation, get your estrogens measured. So therefore, there's going to be a, a bigger lab test done in order to get those done. And you can't just get it from blood. And you can't just get it from urine. That has to be in combination. And if they're not done completely, so if they just research that alone, say, hey, I want to get my estrogens and my metabolites measured. And so therefore, it would cause the doctors to look deeper into it that way. And they'd have to run specific labs that way and get them done and, and start there. But then what happens this? Everything is connected. This concept that we have um, specialist doctors, I know why they have specialist doctors, but it's also a little bit misleading because the minute somebody has something wrong, they send them to a specialist. And I did come up with a definition of a specialist. I, I've never told you. Okay. A specialist is a person that knows more and more about less and less. <laughs> you know this is why this is why people get mad at yes, you. Yes, <laughs> they do. But no, but in, and I'm okay with it. I want to, I, if somebody has a brain tumor, I want a brain specialist to walk right. in. I don't want a podiatrist. Okay. Right. A foot doctor. But here's what happens to this. The body isn't separated parts. It's not. For example, let's go back to the women that have endometriosis. It's very common for them to have thyroid problems because why? Because estrogen can affect the carrier molecules that, that affect the thyroid. So therefore, they separate them. They, they act like they're female hormones and their thyroid hormones. They're all the same thing. They all talk back and forth to each other. Every organ system talks each system. And that's why, that's why if you eat something bad, it can affect you from physically to psychologically because the GI has endocrine responses, neurological responses, digestive responses, all the hormonal responses. And we separate the body. So I believe that, like in my example is, I believe you need fire department doctors and you need carpenter doctors. The reason why our stuff got so popular and even on your show was because we were just speaking carpenter language and it made so much sense. Mm -hmm. Like even right now, people, people had never heard it. No. And, and because we are so dominant, we're so dominant in a form of healthcare, which I believe is needed. I think they, I think they reach way too far most of the time. And that's why so many people are medicated today. And, um, some simple lifestyle things could really change a lot of things for a lot of women. What should men be asking for when getting their hormones tested? Same thing. I get the same thing that you had done. Same exact thing. It's just that, and what you'll find out, what you're going to find out more, it's going to lead you to different causes that are there. Because you're going to notice that, um, we talked about last time, women are so massively affected by mental stress. They really are. And it's so evident on labs. And, um, and that's why, and I learned that young as a, as a doc, that all of a sudden I was sitting there going, I was testing everybody. I'm going, okay, listen, I started running all these labs. I'm like, man, women's stress hormones are so high most of the time. And then how it affected the rest of their, their uh, anabolic responses compared to males. Males, if they have a mental stress, they will have certain endocrine responses, but they won't have the deficiencies that come with it. Um, they'll have more GI issues and things like that to come with it. So, See, I think it's harder for a guy to realize, I think something's not right with yep. my body unless it's like very obvious, like you yep. got a broken ankle. Yep. I feel like men, um, it's just in your all's nature to kind of put it out of sight, out of mind or ignore things. Not so, really. Let me explain why. Okay. You, you, you brought it up at the beginning. You said, is being hormonal, you know, a bad thing? Understand that estrogens make you a lot more sensitive. So if a man is super sensitive, he's got something wrong? Well, let me tell you this. If you start to see a man start to cry and act more woman-like on a regular basis, I can tell you, and I've got thousands and thousands and thousands of labs, I can show you this, that they're starting to become more estrogen dominant. I, mean, I literally had a pastor one time come in and said, I'm crying at movies, I'm emotional, I don't want sex and things like that. And his testosterone was going down, but his estrogens were going really high. And I'm like, physically, and we know this with all the things going on today, we understand there's men injecting themselves with estrogens and women uh, injecting themselves with testosterone. And they will take on those characteristics. They don't need, it's really funny, but if a man or woman has those kind of same abnormal changes, they can physically and mentally present just like that. See, so women, that's what, I think that's why one of the greatest things, women being sensitive, it makes them more aware. Now guys, take a look at this. Estrogens make women more sensitive and that's why they're better at finding problems than men are, even with themselves. So men by nature don't recognize the amount of problems um, because their so, testosterone is so aggressive, it keeps them moving forward. Women, by nature, if their body is off, their body is so sensitive, it feels like they're falling apart even when there's just some hormonal changes. And that's why you see men have more catastrophic deaths. That all of a sudden, it's like, boom, they dropped to have a heart attack. Women actually have so much sensory aspect to it that way that allows them to catch everything way time before. Ideally, how often should you get your hormones tested? I mean, is yep. this uh, every year, every five years? Well, and this is once again... There's no basis besides biased on this is I believe every year, just because knowing the amount of stressors that people go through and what they do to their bodies. Um, now, obviously, 
person's sick, they're going to go through a lot, lot more extensive, a uh, lot more times. But just the, the fact that once a year is a really good time to do it. I was thinking, you know, is there a type of person who isn't a good candidate for getting your hormones tested? And let me explain my theory. If you're somebody who has never changed your diet, you're not physically active, like there's lifestyle things that you haven't been willing to change, then is getting your hormones tested even worth it? Like, should you focus on those things first before hormone testing? Let's let's make this blanket thing. Lifestyle things are by far the most important thing. By far, by far. I mean, I've actually had people come in, both men and women, and I just sat down with them and they just ate so much processed food and so much processed sugar. I said, listen, please don't start. Avoid, you know, eat a little bit more carnivore-ish, eat a little bit more, you know, things this way and come back in three months. Okay, so about three months. You get yeah. your stuff right, then make an appointment yes. three months later. Yeah, because you know why? Because basically you're just going to see a whole cascade of things off. And and that's, that's why I think, um, and that's why if you took any person, any person that the Jimmy has ever walked in any of my offices across the world in 25 years, guess what happens? If they first made lifestyle changes, they would see a dramatic change in their health. And, and some of the most simplest things. And that's, that's, that's why it's frustrating for me when somebody comes in with some health condition that they've been through all these things and gamuts of drugs and surgeries and things that I'm going, and they never told them to make any kind of change whatsoever yet. What are you going to see on a Dutch test that you won't see on just a blood test? Well, remember, so to give people, the audience, a little bit more context to it, when you look at hormones, you have to get an array of different um, things done. So blood gives you certain levels and then urine gives you spe other specific levels. And when you look at, there's a production and there's a conversion, and then once again, they get eliminated. So therefore, when you look at some of the metabolites, that's why they're even called metabolites, they are produced, once again, the, the ovary releases them. Um, specific hormones, and they actually go to your liver and other organs and convert to other forms that need to be used for the body. So the Dutch can grab those that aren't produced once again in the blood and actually measured there. Okay, because so, the Dutch test is a urine test. Yes. And you do it at home. Yep. So that's one thing that's interesting. You make yep. an appointment with someone like Dr. Patrick Flynn, one of your wellness weight clinics, yep. and then they give you a Dutch test. Yep. You take it home and it's just like little, I did this. It's yep. little cards that you pee on and yep. it gives you all of the directions yep. and then you mail it in. Yep. And yep. then your office will tell them what the what the results say. Yep. You get the results back. And, and, and usually at that time, you also synergistically do your blood because you want to have them done roughly the same day. And so therefore, then you can correlate both the things that you have. Now you have a complete view of what's going on and you can sit down and go over everything. And men do the same thing, Dutch test and blood test? Yep. Okay. Yep. What are the most common hormone irregularities you see in men? Um, testosterone low. Testosterone. Progesterone, psychotically low in most women and testosterone, dramatically low in men. It's getting worse. It's getting worse. When I, when I tested guys 25 years ago, compared to now, it's dramatic. And it's getting What's low causing more. that? Lifestyle. Okay, I will tell you that. Um, I'm a big component that um, women are really destroyed by mental stress. Men are destroyed by the lifestyle. And I think they overconsume uh, glucose way too much for way too long a time. And so therefore, they end up you know, having more adipose tissue, which can take our testosterone and convert it into estrogens. Um, what do you mean by glucose? Where do you get that? Sugar. You know, saying you look at your... And, that, 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 and I know a lot of people, sometimes they, they understand that. They, I, we just did a whole... No sugar January. No, you're wrong. You need carbohydrates. You do. It's just that people consume them so much for so long period of time that their glucose and their insulin levels and their hemoglobin A1C continues to get higher and higher. And therefore, there's consequences to it. You know, And so therefore, we're seeing a lot more aromatasing of their testosterone, which means converting it. Because carbs get converted into sugar. Yes, because, well, the majority of them do. But if you have higher fiber ones, they're better for you. So for example, as most people know, if they ever watch my stuff, I'm a huge fan of the carbohydrates that are high in fiber. So I love sauerkraut. It's my favorite thing. You know what I'm saying? It's like, if you ever came up to the Flynn household, you're going to have to eat liver and sauerkraut. Oh boy. You do. <laughs> you don't get out of my house without it. And, um, and because therefore the nutrients you get is so massive from, you know, an organic, great uh, grass fed liver. And then sauerkraut, once again, the fiber and everything that comes from it, high vitamin C, vitamin K's and stuff like that. And sauerkraut, so is, am I right? That's a fermented yes, food? Yes, it is. Fermented. And that's like a big thing, like including a lot of fermented foods in your diet. That's yep. supposed to be really good. Yes, yes. And and so that's why was sometimes people cause can, uh, confuse because I'm like a really, really high protein kind of person. Um, women don't eat enough. They don't even come closer enough. How, and, ma how much protein should a woman be eating every day? It's going to surprise you. Um, let's um, say, can I guess? Yes. 50? Um, that, 
Put it this way, that would make most women sick. What? Dude, I feel like I struggle so much trying to get protein. Mm -hmm. Like I, it is, I am really counting. I'm I'm counting grams of protein in every single thing I eat, trying to get basically, to 50 every day. I don't know how to eat that much. Basically, look at this. Look at, take one pound and convert that to grams. So if you weighed 120 pounds, I'd want you to do 120 grams. I'm sorry. I just don't even understand how it's physically possible for a woman. Like I, it's like, I can't yeah. even, I'm not even hungry enough to get that much. So well, what do we do? And see, that's one thing. Well, well, and you'll hit satiety pretty quickly with proteins and therefore. I feel like that's like 10 it. chicken breasts a day. Well, it depends on what. <laughs> I would, I would, I would, um, I look at, and, and what really what you want to do is, is if you do have a lower protein content, which I don't want you to do, then you have there's specific proteins you do want to have. Um, there's wonderful research out there. One of the major amino acids, because there's 20 major amino acids that we know of. I always say that we know of because we always discover more things. And um, if you look, there's nine of them that are essential, which means you have to eat them. And there's one in particular I really like the most. It's called leucine. And because here's what happens, is it really stimulates muscle protein synthesis. And if you look at the amount of people as they get older, what they do is their protein consumption goes down dramatically. They start losing muscle mass. And a lot of people fall and pass away post that because they can't recover. And so I just like to see and see people from like my little girls, my 10 year old daughter. Yeah, what are they up. eating? What do you have in your 10 year old daughter eat? Because it's pretty much what I'm gonna have to do. She gets up and she makes a great organic duck egg. And then she has a, then she has a, um, a nice chunk about, really about a point, um, one pounds of liver worst in the morning. And then she'll have usually like a chicken breast and some green and sauerkraut and stuff like that. And at night, then we'll have some protein source with some, you know, uh, some form of fermented vegetable. I cannot wait to see what this girl is like when she's my age. Oh, she's awesome. Oh my gosh. I cannot wait. Yep. Like, you know, that's so cool because you get to like test all this stuff yep. on her from very young to see well, how she is as an adult. My 20 year daughter has been eating that day since she was little. And uh, once again, she never had to go through any health consequences that of her friends did and everything. And and that's why my daughters, they kind of laugh a little bit, not in a negative way, but they're like, they watch their friends go through PMS and all things. And and they're like, oh, dad was right. Mm -hmm. Well, and <laughs> and now my my oldest daughter is following my footsteps. Oh, and so cool. it's like, so she's currently in, in school right now doing the same background I did and everything. So yeah, it's kind of exciting. What is this hair test that can tell you how minerals are moving through your body? Um, There's some validity to it that way. Um, I look at more the toxicity component that comes to it that way, because you can notice if you are releasing certain toxic elements, it can be done in hair and stuff. And in certain hair, hair samples, you can um, take certain things. There's just better labs out there. Okay. Okay. There's That's what I want to know. If some are better than others. There is. Um, yeah. What about testing your gut microbiome? Mm -hmm. What can that tell you? Um, if you ever think of this way is a lot of people um, end up with internal infections. It's very common. Um, and what ends up happening is the majority of infections are just overgrown bacteria that we normally have or a parasite or even in viruses that way. Uh, so what it does, it, does, it just gives us a good map of some of the things that need to be done internally. And you'd be surprised. It gives us a very good clue of like what part of the GI system is actually having the biggest problem. You know, you can actually do a stool test and see once again, if you are, you know, have a, over, uh, not digesting your fats properly. So it could be a gallbladder problem. You can actually see there's not enough protein breakdown. So you don't have enough stomach acid in your system that way. So what they do is just give you very good clues of what things are going on. And if you do have any microbial overgrowth, then what happens is, but you know what's really funny? You can usually catch that in blood work first. You can see like your lymphocytes go high or you're triggering an autoimmune condition. You don't know why. You could have some latent infection in your body and it could be residing even in your intestinal tract. And that's why some of the stool testing does a very good job. Now, you didn't have me do the gut microbiome test. How come? Um, because we just got your labs back. Oh, okay. So that is something that happens after? Yes. Oh, okay. So you see, I don't know. So yes. so you do the Dutch test, you do the blood test, yes. and then you well, do other so, things. So here's what happened if you want to get into it a little bit. So your labs came back and uh, obviously there were some things we found and you have a major immune problem. And what's really throwing off your hormones is actually your immune system. And so therefore it's quite evident so that when you take these labs anywhere you go, people are going to say, well, you have this. And where your frustration come in being so young, you understand that if this would have been left, you know, all of a sudden you would, once again, you'd hit a wall, your all hormones would tank. And all of a sudden you'd be like, oh, there we go. There's your fire. But this has been going on for years, especially at how high your levels were. And so therefore, it, and then if you look at some of your immune markers came back, which showed that you have an infection sitting in there. And therefore, once again, so that's why, so now your hormone system was telling us kind of, and I'm thinking about what we were telling us, hormones are messengers. So these levels came out and said, listen, there's an infection here. 
So now you have to dig a little deeper to find out what it is. Okay. Yeah. We're going to dig deeper <laughs> into what all my yep. lab said. And yep. I'm willing to be 110% yep. transparent. Okay. Even if it's embarrassing, no. you can say it. Well, I already prepped my team. I already yeah. told the guys on yep. the video team. I was like, you yep. might hear some, you know, about my poop or whatever. Yep. I don't know. Yep. But anyway, before we do that, yep. I'm going to run through a couple common problems yep. that people have and then just rapid fire what you think they may be deficient in okay. if they struggle with this. Okay. Chronic fatigue. Adrenal issues. So what I would say number one, vitamin C. Always waking up at 3 or 4 a.m. Blood sugar issues. Um, therefore, vitamin D would be a huge issue there. Brittle nails. Protein deficiency. Constipation. Magnesium deficiency. Heavy periods. A host of hormonal problems. And <laughs> <laughs> there's, yeah, there's, there's no single thing. Brain fog. Um... It's going to sound funny. Lack of glucose in the brain. Okay. Okay. Sensation of pins and needles. Uh, B1 deficiency. Muscle pain. Oh, potassium deficiency would probably be number one. That was so fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> See, that I just did a reel that, that got probably 20 million views on this. And I said, I, I really get frustrated that people talk about root causes. Because you know why? Because there is no root cause. There's always multiple things that go on. And so that's why I went to like a this for that. It's still hard for me to do that, that way because your issues have multiple things going on. That's going to get the crunchy community all up and all. Oh, they say we go for the root cause. No one goes for root cause because I've never met a woman or a guy that just has one thing going on. It's impossible. It's virtually impossible and stuff because there's so many factors that do it. I just learned a new life hack that I've implemented into my skincare routine that I have to tell you about. When you get home for the evening, before you start making dinner, do your skincare routine. Do it first. One, you're going to love getting that daily grime off right away. And two, when you do it first, all you have to do is then brush your teeth when you're ready to go to bed. Because you know what sucks is when we have a full face of makeup on and we feel ourselves starting to get real tired. And we're like, oh, I really want to go to bed, but now I'm just too tired to do my skincare. Right? See, it happens to all of us. My go-to skincare brand is Nimi. Modern skincare with timeless values in a conservative-owned company. Start your three-step skincare routine for an easy introduction into luxury, high-powered skincare that will help fight the signs of aging, brighten dull skin, and even out texture. Now, I've never been a full-blown acne person, but I have always struggled with teeny tiny pimple-like bumps in texture. Using the Nimi Hydrating Retinol Moisturizer and their Vitamin C Toner and Serum has really helped immensely with texture. That's what the Hydrating Moisturizer did, but also glow. That's what the other things did. Go to NimiSkincare.com. Use code Alex Clark for 10% off. That's NimiSkincare.com with code Alex Clark for 10% off. Try my favorite skincare company today. Find the link in the code in the description. I've never had my hormones tested. Yep. This is the first time I've had anybody do any lab work on me. Yep. How bad was it? Um, okay, to give you an idea, um, you tested positive for an autoimmune disorder and um, it'd be more classified like Hashimoto's that way. And uh, so therefore, that was... Um, wasn't really surprised, concerned. That's why we ran it. And, and it give you any ideas to give you ranges and optimums we talked about before. You know, you want to be less than 60. You were at 1,280. On my thyroid. And then that was just one of your autoimmune markers. Then you actually had the, your thyroid globin antibody, uh, which was elevated also. So it shows destruction of your thyroid and shows destruction of some of the things that happen within the thyroid itself. Um, and therefore, once again, now what it does, if that continues, it manifests into major thyroid issues and then people start seeing their hormones levels go low. And then if you look at the standard of care for someone who has a low thyroid, they'll put them on some form of medication. You have a levothyroxine or a synthroid. And that's just a T4 replacement. And it never addresses what really caused the whole factor in the first place. So the immune issue now creates a destructive aspect to the uh, endocrine response. And now there's endocrine changes and it can change anything from your, from energy, skin, hair, nails, all the stuff we talked about before. And therefore people are going, oh my goodness, I don't know what's going on. So these things, and to be at 1200, this had to happen a long time ago. That's what I wondered. Yeah. How long has this been going on for me? To, to be that elevated, uh, so no one's going to ever truly know, but years and years and years. Like childhood or, or Could no? Been. Could have been. No one's going to, they said, that's one thing. That's why this stuff should have been tested. For example, the, the same blood work and same urine work I did on you, my 10 year old's had, my 14 year old's had, my, you know, they've had it since the, every single year since they were 10 years old. So my 20 year old has had at least, you know, 10 or so tests done. It's the same thing you've had done. And once again, her numbers are perfect. 
Okay, how sure are you that it's Hashimoto's is what it might be? Well, once again, I don't really give you the diagnosis because I don't really care. Um, but if you just look up the TPO antibody being that elevated, there's an immune factor that contributes to that. And so they diagnose that and create that. Dr. Hashimoto is the one that came up with that. What causes thyroid problems like what I have? Well, once again, here's, here's the, the, the thing that needs to be looked at. You have major immune issues. And so therefore, the immune issue now translates into that. Now, and if you look, your lymphocytes came back very elevated. So therefore, it shows that you have a certain infection sitting there because lymphocytes are your T and B cells. So what does that mean? An infection where? We don't know. Your labs, remember, your labs dictate and tell us what's going on. Then we got to dig a little deeper. Okay. And so that's what I need to do, like a gut microbiome test for? Yes. Yep. Price, probably, probably a little bit more than that, considered that your lymphocytes uh, are elevated. Um, but like I said, there could be viral, there could be bacterial, there could be parasitic. Uh, we need to find out. What are the other types of tests that you would recommend I do? Right now, it'll be another blood work um, and then actually a stool by okay. far. Because once again, you have to find those immune triggers and stuff. And that's quite self-evident from what your blood work came back as. That's what I'm wondering because mm -hmm. you know what everybody's been telling me? They're like, oh, you're going to have to go gluten-free. Do I have to go gluten-free? Um, Probably only for the rest of your life. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I don't want to be gluten-free. I hate those people. Well, it's so annoying. I don't want to be that person. Well, here's what happens. It's there's There's mimicry that happens with that protein. And so therefore it kind of triggers the immune response and leads to some problems. So that's why you see it very common in the whole gluten-free community that they avoid those things because they see less, you know, autoimmune responses. Now you've probably seen this because um, they've been on your shows and I mean, not yours, but I mean, just turning point self, you know, Jordan Peterson and his daughter. Well, if you notice, they stick pretty much to carnivore. Well, the reason why they, they did so well on carnivore is because they pretty much limited most of the immune triggering foods there are. Oh. And that's why they saw a positive response. Okay. Now, I would like to talk to Jordan and his, and his, his daughter because there's going to be some deficiencies that they're missing. Um, I like, a, like recently on my show, I just did a talk about, um, I call it carnivore-ish. You know, if you want to do carnivore, you're just gonna, you just got to get all the building blocks. And you're missing even certain B vitamins and certain vitamin C and other things that you're doing when you just do carnivore. So that's why people say, Doc, you're high protein because you're carnivore. No, I'm not because it, you got to get all of your fat cell vitamins, all the, the vitamins and trace minerals and minerals that you need that way. And I know it sounds funny. It's it's hard to skin it from muscle meats or even plant sources that way. So you need to do a combination of things that way to, to do it that way. So that's why you'll see it's very common for autoimmune people to avoid gluten and because it's more of a higher immune triggering based food. Okay, here's the thing, though. Mm -hmm. If you make sure that things like pasta are gluten-free, yep. whatever, but otherwise the bread that you eat is homemade sourdough, for example, mm -hmm. am I, can I eat that or that doesn't count? Do you want the good or bad news? No! <laughs> I am so mad! <laughs> well, see, that's the consequence what of— What if it's organic sourdough starter? No? Well, then you just have organic immune-triggering things. Dang it! <laughs> <laughs> that's like that's like it, that's like uh, what you know got me in health when I was young. I was reacting to an egg. People say, "Well, why don't you just eat an organic egg?" I said, "Well, I'll be organically sick." <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's I know, and see yeah. that's, that's the tough part. But see, but see, here's what happens: this we're not talking supplementation, we're not talking drug, we're not talking things you need to take and buy. We're saying, listen, just you have to avoid these things that could be detrimental for your body, right? And see, and nobody is the same. And see, yeah. that's, that's the part where we're trying to say gluten-free is good for everybody or, or this is good for everybody. Well, that, that doesn't make sense. See, that's where labs can really dictate what a person needs. So I'm just, I am against like tribal thinking in all healthcare. But I just thought that the reason that some people need to be gluten-free or the reason they react is because they're reacting to chemicals that are just put on like American breads and things. Well, there can be some truth to that. Okay. And, um, but it's been so researched quite well on the, immune triggering effects of gluten to the system. So therefore, you know, you just see a very positive response. To that. Okay. So the other thing that I was looking up when it comes to Hashimoto's, which again, you're, yep. you can't diagnose me. Yep. I have to get, do that somewhere take the, else. Take to any primary doctor if you want okay. a diagnosis, but they only do it for insurance purposes anyways, but you, it would, you know, you can this take This is your anyway. prediction. Mm -hmm. So I can go and find out yep. and yep. We'll, we'll see what they end up saying, but this is mm -hmm. your prediction. So let's just say if Hypothetical. If it yep. is Hashimoto's, yep. I read a lot about avoiding soy. Now, one thing about me, I don't eat a yep. lot of soy. I mean, because I don't eat processed food. So where else do you find soy products? Um, well, um, here's what happens is I know what they're saying about soy because of the gertrogenic effect of thyroid that way. But once again, you you can find it more as additives. And if you're not really directly eating soy on a regular basis. And, and I think that the soy thing 
once again, soy is, if, if you talk to the vegan community, that's their, that's their holy grail because it does has the, the highest, most available protein of any really vegetable source that way. And um, so therefore that's why they use it a lot. Um, but unless you're consuming it at a high levels, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't. Now, once again, obviously there's GMO factors and everything there, but um, um, I wouldn't make it like a huge thing for you to avoid them. Okay. So what is the difference between hypo and hyperthyroidism? Well, when you look at there's there's two major hormones, well, there's really four, but there's two major hormones, T3 and T4, and then free T4 and free T3. Um, when those levels start to go low, then what happens is the, the metabolic rate and everything starts to slow down because once again, T4 is the main one produced by thyroid and a little bit of T3. And then, then T4 goes to your liver and converts in the major T3 and those things contribute. So if those start to go low, you start to go into hypo. If those were elevated, that would be considered graves. And um, therefore you're going to go up to a high level and you can start having all those negative symptoms that come from the, the T4 and T3 being elevated. What do I have? Um, so you still are considered once again, um, just in a basically Hashimoto's view. So it can, the autoimmune aspect's triggered. So it can actually go either way. Hypo or hyper. Okay, because this is what I was wondering. Yep. I lo was looking at the symptoms yep. for this yep. and I have everything except weight gain or inability yep. to lose weight. I've always been really small my entire life, but otherwise, um, brittle nails, yep. uh, hair loss. Yep. In September, I told you, in September, I was getting my hair colored and yep. my hair colorist said, hey, yep. obviously I'm not a doctor. You need to go get your, your stuff checked, but I am guessing you have a thyroid issue. Yep. You are losing so much more hair than you should be just in a, in a yep. hair wash. And so she warned me about that. True. I have that symptom. Um, majorly out of nowhere in the last three to five months, I am struggling so much with joint pain, uh, tingling feeling. I yep. feel like my legs are constantly restless. I yep. thought it was magnesium. Yep. So I've been making sure I've been putting magnesium lotion on every yep. night and because I can't stay in this like restless leg feeling and my joints, it's just like pain in my knees all the time. And listen how embarrassing this is. Mm -hmm. My massage therapist, I get a massage once a month. He's trying to move my arms around yep. and he's got like a little Asian accent and he's yep. so cute. And he said something like, you like T-Rex. <laughs> like my arms are always bent. It's very hard for me to straighten my arms and my limbs. I'm so stiff, extreme joint stiffness. Um, definitely, it, it talked about like highs and lows and moods. Yep. And my boss, when I told my boss about this, she was like, oh, well, I'm not surprised at all. You have the highest highs and the lowest lows. Yep. When I am in a low mood, it's yep. like nobody can motivate me or get through to me. Yep. I'm like, the world is ending. <laughs> my podcast <laughs> sucks. You know, I'm, everything's <laughs> failing, you know, and then I will have a great day. And I'm like, everything's great. It's yep. just, I am like that. Um, so she wasn't surprised by that symptom. And what are the, oh, constipation. I've been very open about this. Yep. With my audience. Yep. I didn't know till the last couple years that it's not normal to not poop every day. Yep. I would poop once a week or something and I just thought, oh, that's just how my body works. Nope. 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 And that's why I said, you look at how high your antibodies going on. It's been going on for a long time. And what is very common, if you have one triggered, you're going to have usually multiple triggered. So one of the things that we'll do when we look for some viruses and things like that hanging out in your body, we'll probably run the other autoimmune markers to see if those are evident too, which can be all the other tissue destruction that you could be experiencing. Okay, so what else did it say about, um, it, it there was something alarming in my labs about progesterone. Well, yeah, but let's start here. If you know, it's kind of funny because you live in Phoenix, okay? I'm in Green Bay. I, and it's very common for people to have major vitamin D deficiencies. You live in Phoenix. And you have major vitamin D deficiency. You came back at 25. Okay. I'm an indoor cat. Yeah. So by, I try to tell people. So by nature, um, if you ever look at seasonal affective disorder, it's that the only known really factor causes low vitamin D. And yours was clinically low, very low and stuff. So um, one skin. So therefore, now once again, people say, well, doc, would you recommend and uh, taking some vitamin D? Yes, but I live in Green Bay. I have no choice. I, you want to get your skin on the sun on a regular basis and stuff, especially living down here. And so vitamin D was pathologically low. And one of the major factors that causes vitamin D to actually can, can suppress and bring that marker down is just normal vitamin D levels. And so that's why I said, okay, based on your labs, and see a lot of people say, well, doc, should everybody take vitamin D? Um, there's a justification that most people need it, even kids. But if you don't know what your lab is, you don't know how much you should really do. That's why if you notice, I gave you a judgment based on your lab, what you do. Yeah, you said 20,000 IU. Yep. 20,000 a day? Per day. Okay, well, we have to talk about this because yep. uh, you said go to Whole Foods or whatever. Yep. Um, and so I looked and I didn't, you told me to get vitamin D K2. K2. Why? Yes. Because here's what happens. When vitamin D started to get really popular in the 90s, they started taking it like crazy. 
But once again, vitamin D helps mobilize calcium. So taking it for long periods of time, what it can do can actually relate to kidney stones and, and other calcification problems. So what they realize, guess what happens? K2 is the major vitamin that directs calcium where it goes. So they found out once again that with having that balance, there's been less chance of actually having any negative side effects from taking vitamin D itself. How do you know if you need to be taking regular vitamin D or vitamin D K2? Um, I don't think anybody should take vitamin D without taking K2 with it. Okay. Here's, and now, here's once again, I'm a huge K2 person to eat. And obviously, you should always get it from your food. But if you're taking vitamin D, you should take it together. I just, I had a hard time in the grocery store finding, mm -hmm. you said 20,000 IU yep. a day for a week. Yep. And then I go down to 10,000 IU. Yep. Yep. All of the vitamin D K2 bottles and things I was Thousand. looking at. Yeah, it's like, yep. so am I supposed to be taking 20 pills a day? I just, well, you I get, was freaked out. And you can get much higher dose ones that way. I couldn't so. find any. So you're going to have to tell me <laughs> later, like what brand or what I need yes. to be ordering. Because in the grocery yep. store, I was like, I am not in the gummies. They had all these options. Oh, yeah. It, and then, the, and then a lot of them, it, it, it said sunflower oil and all this yeah. crap in there, and yeah, I'm like, don't I don't know about all this. Yeah. So I, I held. There off. are good sources, and that that's true. I would try to tell people that there's there's good ones you can get that way and stuff from different places. So yeah. Okay, so now that I did this lab work with you, we have these results. Yep. What is my next step? I need to make an appointment with who? Like um, my functional medicine doctor? Well, depends if they know what they're doing. Okay. And How do you know? How do you know if somebody knows what they're doing well, see, with this? That, that's the conundrum. Because, what about a Hashimoto specialist? Um, um, well, once again, the, the most that they would do, they'd probably even suggest, a, you know, some steroids for you just because your levels are so high. Oh, yeah. So stuff. that's the other thing I was going to ask about. A lot of people talk about with an autoimmune disorder and especially Hashimoto's, they're on some low dose of uh, medication. Do you LDN? But th that's, that's more from an integrative doctor. They'll sometimes do LDN. Um, but what happens a lot of times if they see markers as elevated as yours, they want to calm the immune system down. So they'll use a form of steroid, which is really detrimental. So I don't recommend that. So what else could I do if I well, don't want to do steroid? Well, if you think this way, first of all, there, there are factors where I found in your labs by vitamin D and other things that can be done. But here's the, here's the biggest factor. When you look at any autoimmune condition, there are still some major triggers in there that did it. So that's why even if you took steroids, even if you did vitamin D, even if you did things to try to counteract it, even if you avoided gluten, okay, uh, guess what happens? It's only going to drop so much. There, there, Because of your labs, it showed that you had an internal infection, seeing their lymphocytes go high like that. And so therefore, it's just about digging them and actually find them and starting to, you know, get rid of them. And then you're going to see those markers start to come down dramatically. And, and you don't think it's something like, uh, could be a sign of like leukemia or something? Um, no, your other markers didn't show that. So. Okay. Yep. My cholesterol looked really high. Is that something I should be worried about? Um, no, because here's what happens is your total cholesterol is fine. Um, you had just a small elevation of your LDL, but obviously look at state you're in. See, um, people think of this way, LDL levels high for a long period of time can actually, you know, lead to some problems. But here's what happens. If you think of this way, LDL is a carrier molecule. And your body right now is in a state of repair. So I expect that to be elevated. It's remember, your body saying, hey, I need to, you know, mobilize these things for repair. And so therefore, what am I going to do? I'm going to use a carrier protein to, to from our liver and shift it out like crazy. And therefore, it starts to elevate. And so people see it elevate and they go, oh my goodness, we got to knock it down. I'm like, well, no, no. Remember, this is this is where this is where a lot of thinking, even in the natural world, um, drives you nuts a little bit. We've lost how intelligent, smarter body is. And I tell people blood work, exams, everything should be like an observation of what's it doing. You know, I tell people hormones are by definition called messengers. Well, listen to the message, you see them? And it can lead you to some amazing things. And that's why, that's why I'm coming from the background I had. It was interesting. I got to look at the body differently. Um, and I said, okay, listen, there's gotta be a way of actually figuring this stuff out. And then I've been able to prove it clinically. And so the nice thing is this, your blood work and your Dutch tests, once again, are abnormal. But you know what some of the most exciting things are? Yes, you can see all the symptomatology and all the things that you suffer with change. But it's great watching those labs back normal. So everybody that's watching this right now, we're talking about how off it is. But the exciting part is watching you recover and watch them come down. And see, nobody can, nobody can argue that. They can say, they can try to argue the messenger. They can probably say that my, my doctorate's chiropractic and so therefore it's different. I'm like, yeah, but that, education allowed me to look at things differently. And so therefore, because you look at this way, just some of the things people are watching about right now, they're like, this makes so much sense. It's not done that way. Yes, because conventionally, they're taught to think this way. We recognize the body is very intelligent. Okay. And so therefore, that's why we sit there and go, everything that we base, there's a structural component that can, you know, be a stressor to the body. And you're saying that, we as in chiropractic. Yes. Yes. And 
in the majority of our profession has just be, tried to become just like medicine. That's all they've done. Trying to be a natural therapy for some condition and they try to fit in. But that's not how our profession started. So that's why, that's why the biggest thing that any medical person watching or any person that could uh, like try to you know, debate what I'm saying, they can't argue the message so they have to tear on the what? The messenger. And they go, but no, no, no. It's my degree. It's my education on that one that's just got me to recognize to say, listen, um, the body's massively intelligent. And so therefore, if you look at the end stage of a disease, what it took to get there, there was clues along the way. And there's bodies, the body was actually giving you clues and alarms and, and hormone levels and, and lab levels that actually go off. And we can catch that. And they're wrong. there's sometimes things get so bad that drugs and surgery are eminent. Like I said, your house catches on fire. You have no choice. Okay. And then my other education, uh, uh, um, and my other school and all my postgraduate education, I started to put all these things together. And so therefore that's why when you look at your stuff that way, you go, okay, listen, that those markers are so elevated. Okay. The body's telling us the immune system is highly triggered. So guess what happens? You can try to alter it medication. You can try to even try to naturally give some things that way, but without digging to find out what's triggering the immune system. And, and once again, in your labs. So once again, and no doctor is going to look at your labs, what we ran, and say that they're not normal. I mean, that they're not abnormal, because they are. It's just that they may, may take a little different approach. That's, so am I, based on where I'm at here, mm -hmm. and that, I mean, are we catching this early or we're catching this late? Well, we caught it, here's in why. In the middle? Here, we caught it in the middle. Okay. Because here's why, because there's certain hormone levels that were thrown off, but having it that elevated, um, it should have been a lot worse. Okay, so my question is, Is do you think that there is going, there is a path for me that I won't have to do a medication or am I likely going to have to, um, in your a, opinion? Uh, it depends how much you want to avoid gluten. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so yes. yeah, so this is I mean, where you're saying yes. some lifestyle changes, if somebody, it depends on how much they're willing to do. If, if a person is not willing to, to make lifestyle changes under person of my direction, I would tell you not even start and just find a medication. I will literally refer you to a doctor and say, you'll be on their medication the rest of your life and you'll have major consequences from it, but it's your choice. Okay. See, that's the difference. And, and the majority of Americans, um, once they're shown, they say, listen, that they can do it, they, won't, they wanna make some changes. But there's some people that won't make any changes. And as a doc, I have to say, then guess what happens? Don't start, you'll be very disappointed because uh, we understand that's hard to avoid certain things. Does Hashimoto's affect your lymph nodes? It affects everything. It's an immune condition. Okay. Remember, the immune system affects every tissue and cell of the body. So Everything. I guess I just don't know much about autoimmune yep. disease. Yep. Just uh, imagine it's a highly inflammatory condition. And if you look at there's one thing that every doctor, even your dentist will agree with, and even a podiatrist will agree with, the, the start of every condition starts with some inflammatory response. And it's really funny. So I pulled out some recent research. And I'll keep this, you know, um, off so we don't get kicked off. Um, pull out some major research because I predicted this before it happened. And I said, listen, with over the last three years, um, the government and a certain political party really pushed a certain form of treatment during our pandemic. Mm -hmm. And what you're now seeing is those things have created now, and I have some wonderful research, and I'll even send it to you so you can put it in the links below, um, showing that getting that form of treatment that the government wants you to get, the rate of Hashimoto's and autoimmune disease have skyrocketed. I didn't do that. Skyrocket. No, you didn't. But here's what happens this is there wasn't that's the immune trigger. Okay. See, so foods, viruses, bacteria, parasites, um, heck, mental stress, all these things can be immune triggers. See, and they're different for everybody. So when someone comes and says, Hey, they read a book on on Hashimoto's and said, uh, hey, guess what? I cured my Hashimoto's. I'm like, great. I don't disagree with them. But that path for them is not the same for everybody else. Okay. And that's where it gets frustrating in a natural world saying that there's protocols or in the medical world saying there's protocols because there's no two people that are individually the same. It's impossible. And so that's why when I talk about when I talk about the rate of Hashimoto's going up like crazy or even graves going up, it's because those form of treatments are, guess what, are very immune triggering. If you look at what happens, um, what they do with children and adults and stuff like that in the last three years, they're triggering pieces in, for people's immune systems. That's why if you ever look, there's so many immune diseases and they keep it going up at a rate that's um, it's unprecedented. And, and that causes degeneration to people's bodies. Could what I have affect my fertility? Absolutely, Kim. Absolutely. Tell me about that. Because I thought my progesterone levels looked really high. Um, 
Well, here's what happens. Uh, Projection levels were abnormal, and that's okay. I mean, it's just, uh, they, they're, they can get back to normal. They were high or they were low? Um, here's what happened. Okay, so therefore, when your production was elevated, but your metabolism was low. So therefore, that's why in one lab, they were elevated, and in another, they were what? They were low. And so it shows you that you're having a problem with your liver because you're not bringing through the phases to convert that and move that out. And so it starts to build up. And so if I don't get this fixed, it could, what, am I more likely for miscarriage or not being able to get pregnant at all? Um, yeah, you have a higher rate of, um, you know, of infertility and stuff. So, and that's one thing. That's why when, when Christy, my wife presented with all these things going on, um, just by running labs, I'm like, okay, here's what we need to do. And wrong, and I have to make this very clear. Nobody, including you, has ever seen me or one of my docs or anything like that in history, unless they've already been through all this stuff already. And I don't mean labs, I mean some horrible things. And so most people end up coming to us because of the failed issues that go on that way. And then we just run some some lab work and say, okay, listen, here's what we got going on. And they're just flabbergasted, just like you are. You know, you're sitting there going, that's why when you take your lab, you can take it to any doctor of any kind and they won't disagree with it. They'll just look and they'll say, here's what some things we could do with it. If it's Hashimoto's that I have, how would I get it under control? It's just getting rid of gluten and... No, no so always remember this. There are immune triggers. Okay. okay. And so it's about finding them. It really is. And as you start to remove them from the body, then guess what happens? Your immune system is not being triggered. And so therefore, the, that marker will start to come down. Now, the current medical system will tell you it never come down. They will tell you it won't come down, but we'll prove them wrong. So I need to do a gut microbiome test. Yep. Do I need to do a food allergy test? Um, Not right now. Okay. And because here's why. Because your lymphocytes on your labs were so elevated that guess what happens? It shows that there's infection. So can there be foods right now that could be more inflammatory for you? Absolutely. But once again, we talked about this before. If we can, if we find that major immune trigger of being some microbial, we don't know what it is yet, then what's going to happen is you're going to find yourself reacting less to foods. And believe it or not, you could react less to the gluten later in life that way. What do you think about red light therapy for Fantastic. Hashimoto's? Red light, red, well, but remember. I've been going every day. But here's what happens. Use red light therapy as something positive. Don't use it as a treatment form. Right. Because then people do is they see this is what they do. Uh, they'll look at some condition and look for something natural medical and don't realize and they'll do it and they say, oh, it didn't, didn't work. No, no, red light therapy is good for you regardless of what's going on. Even if you have nothing going on. Why do you like it? Um, remember, the full electric response to your body is no different than the sun. There's different wavelengths that are fantastic for our tissues. There's certain frequencies that are fantastic for our tissues. So red light and, and actually the sun. People, people forget. Do you understand? I'm going to go to Hawaii on Saturday. And do you know if you sit out to in the beach and get just beautiful monorays, and remember, don't burn your skin, protect your skin. I mean, we got to make sure that there's no burning. But do you understand the amount of melatonin production that's produced for you? And that's why if you notice, you sit in the sun for a while, do you notice you get tired? Mm -hmm. You see, you, know, you sit in front of a fire. That photochemistry coming to you, okay, actually helps you produce melatonin. So that's why it's good to be in front of a campfire. It's good to be out in the sun. It's good, to, and, and it actually gets better sleep. And so therefore, you got to be, by using therapy like that. And it's cheap and effective too. One of you tagged me in your story with your Olivia body wash and said, it was everything Alex Clark said it was. Look, you are my friends. I talk to you more than anyone else. If I like something, you're going to know. And if I don't like something, you're going to know. And I love Olivia Organic Prebiotic Body Wash. Knowing that I definitely have an autoimmune condition, it is more important than ever to keep my exposure to hormone-disrupting ingredients as low as I possibly can. Olivia Organic Prebiotic Body Wash has accelerated healing power for skin because it feeds beneficial microbes, psoriasis, eczema, burns, signs of aging, scars. If these are skin struggles for you, Olivia is an amazing non-toxic body wash. While searching for a solution to her daughter's persistent eczema, Kelly, Olivia's founder, learned that the body's natural ability to protect itself is stripped away when regularly bombarded with harsh, chemically-derived beauty products. Not all non-toxic body washes are the same. Not in texture, not consistency, scents, or bonus perks. The green tea honeysuckle scent comes highly recommended from me. And of course, that is a totally real fragrance and nothing artificial. Go to Olivia.com, use code Alex15 for 15% off to revamp your family's body wash to not only be non-toxic, but just healthier for your skin. That's Olivia.com with code Alex15 for 15% off. As always, everything is in the show notes. Why not glutathione for Hashimoto's? Um, okay, here's, here's why. Now, I have no problem if you go to like an integrative doctor and get like um, 
IV bag of glutathione or even a, a shot, okay, which is really effective. It's just that the majority of it taken orally is a reduced form. That means if you go to your liver and has to be converted, guess what? You might not even be able to do it just because of the phase one problem that you have shown up on your labs. Would you say based on my labs and what it showed about my liver, mm -hmm. I know that alcohol is bad regardless. Yep. Is it exceptionally bad for me or just normal bad? Here's what happens. If your liver is normal, alcohol is still bad. Okay. And yours is off. Okay. So it makes it worse. And you are, you have some B vitamin deficiencies. You have some, and see, and no joke. Remember you talk about skin and hair. And so people take a biotin supplement. Well, you already tested that you're actually low in that already. It's on your lab. So what does that mean? We need to get you um, sufficiency of it. Your I'm not a big dictate. drinker. I'm yep. not a drink. I don't even drink once yep. a week. Yep. Maybe once or twice a month. I like to have a couple cocktails going out or whatever, but I'm not a heavy partier or drinker anyway. But I just wondered if like I need to be like fully no alcohol whatsoever, which is heartbreaking. Well, I love a cocktail. We'll, we'll put it this way. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like um, walking around with a couple of pebbles in your shoe and just throwing one in your shoe every once in a while. <laughs> a little it's uncomfortable. Sorry, it's just, it's just irritated their body. See, if you think of this way, people, and this is why I tell people lifestyle things, is getting them to change is the biggest thing. And it's why we see so much disease today because people are triggering themselves on a regular basis. And I come along and, and, and I literally tell people, you need to make these changes. And if you don't, it just makes it more difficult. And, um, and sometimes non recoverable if you don't make changes. So you talked about how like the glutathione that you're going to find at your local whole, whole foods or natural grocery or whatever, it's, usual, it's usually um, a reduced, a reduced form. form. And, and there could be some benefit. It's just that, you know, it, I would say eat the foods that are going to be more um, productive of your own glutathione. And if you want to, if you really want to take something clinically, then get a shot or do an IV bag of it. Okay. So how do you know if a brand is a good supplement or not? Um, sourcing is obviously the greatest, less preservatives, more the organic, more whole food that way. Um, minimally processed is always the best. So there's companies out there that do a wonderful thing. Ours does an amazing thing. <laughs> no, no, okay. Yeah, no, but remember, but I don't want to, I want to, to say that, but I mean, just, there's just a lot of great companies out there, but see, if you notice, I think I want the listeners to know it's really important to be guided by someone. It really is because a person that's guided, that's going to guide you, is probably going to give you a lot better advice than trying to research things on your own. And I'm a big person that shows people what to research and what to do and things like that. And um, and so just having a guide is very important. Could turmeric be helpful for me for anti-inflammatory purposes? Well, believe it or not, it's one thing I wrote on your protocol. Oh, oh, I have a protocol? Mm -hmm. Oh, can you read it to me? I don't have it on me right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> so yes, because there are things obviously I, I wrote for you that I want you to start on based on your labs right now. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yep. Okay, great. What are some supplements that everybody should have in their medicine cabinet? Let's start this way. I want n people to have none in their, in their cabinet. Because they're just living so well. They're so healthy. That's what I want, number one. Okay. And so I tell people is this is, I'm, remember, I'm such a big lifestyle person. And it, I'm not joking. I'm trying to get everybody to do the, the best, healthiest things first. And then, and then if you can't do certain habits and you're deficient in certain things, then we're going to need to what? supplement things. And it's not forever. One thing about the wellness way, you guys don't want people on supplements forever. It's it's a it's a temporary thing to get you right and then you should ideally be able to just live life, right? Right. right. And and that's the thing. So it's like but remember that also takes lifestyle changes. Yeah. And so that's and then there's a lot of people. Now Durham, let's let's just go back to like where I live in Green Bay. Um wonderful city. You guys here, you know, like I said, you got to come up there. It's a beautiful city. And but we don't get the sun available like you guys do down here. So I'm going to have to supplement with it. Uh, a certain time per year. I will. Otherwise, I will end up with low vitamin D levels. And then I could have mood and physical change that could happen from that way. So it's it's universal both in men and women. Um, now, if you ever look at this way, I look at some of the things that are, that are so vitally important. You, and I would tell people always this, start with your fat soluble vitamins, just your D, K, you know, E. And um, because when you look at your fat soluble vitamins, they're so essential for everything we need in the body. They really are. And then you got to look at our, your trace minerals and, and stuff. And those things are, you know, um, so essential for people to have. And now once again, can you grab all those from your food? Absolutely. Now there are a couple of medicinal herbs I just think are just, you know, I did. What, <laughs> I did, terrible? No, I think are, are absolutely amazing. Oh, amazing? amazing? What are they? <sighs> Number one is called cassandra. It's actually known as the longevity herb for women because it has such a major effect on their liver. I can honestly tell you, I can't remember. My little girls have had it their whole life. My wife has had it their whole life. 
Um, it's it's almost it's it's one of those remedies that are just if you look it up, like I said, it's it's known to help women in so many ways from stress purposes, liver purposes. And that's why it's known as a, a major longevity herb for women. And it's actually really known for beauty too and stuff. And that's why it helps with skin and other things. It's it's one of those one of those things that just kind of unanimously affects every woman. Why is that different than collagen? Um, remember, collagen has certain amino acids that you want, um, but it doesn't have the benefit to the liver that something like cassandra does. No, we need certain amino acids for so our liver. So the cassandra, because you said I had liver issues, that might be really good for me. Sorry, you're, sorry, right now. It's on my protocol. <laughs> it's on, it's on, now, I hate okay. to even use that word protocol because I would never want somebody, and that's why I'm, I'm so, don't like to talk about certain things because I don't want everybody running out saying, oh my goodness, Alex got her blood work done. That's the Things problem. Things change. And I'm going to take, and I, now I'm going to take the Alex Clark protocol. And if you aren't, don't have your own hormones tested, this could it's, jack you up because right. what if you, you could be totally opposite than me. Yes. That's why you can't do, uh, yep. this is only for me. Nobody's allowed to copy me. That's right. And, that, and that's big because I, I get frustrated in the natural field to where they publicize a supplement or an herb or things like that. And they try to blanket it across for everybody that way. And, um, and it's hard for me to, to accept that. No, once again, are there a couple of things I believe that could be done that way? Sure. But, but the majority of things are are just advertised like they're a cure all for every person and stuff of like that, and and not everything's good for everybody. Yeah. Okay. So you like Cassandra for women yep. a, a, a lot of times, yep. and then what else? Um, supplements you really like? Um, this is gonna surprise people, but um, one of my favorite things of all time is called is just chamomile. Oh, what if I just like chamomile tea? It's fantastic. Um, I think it should be done on a regular basis. Um, it's just that the fact that I think uh, they want to get a little higher concentration for people when they're starting a recovery process. Isn't so, that also good for in inflammation? Mm -hmm. Yep. There's, Ooh. there's, there's major, there's major effects, um, from hormonal effects to digestive effects. Um, so I love those. Um, um, another thing I know it's really simple. Let's go back to even some ancient remedies. Do you understand that most of them were in tea form? Herbs that were liquefied in the tea forms. And so that's why I tell people. Herbs are just ancient remedies that have been around for thousands of years, and that's why they have so much backing to them that way. So, and then, I mean, people, people, what they do, and here's one thing that, if you ever look at, medicine has done a wonderful job of people looking for the newest thing. You're saying, what's the newest thing coming out? And there's ancient things that have been around for thousands of years that we take for granted. We take for granted things like green tea. We take for granted that. And and the the constituents in green tea once again, have a hormonal effect, have a digestive effect, have a neurological effect. And so those things, so you'll see a lot of times on my Instagram, um, me and my girls will have some green tea with lemon sitting in there. And um, you'll see that, uh, I mean, and we don't realize that if we can get people on these lifestyle things, just the amount of things that can change and reverse in that process are big. So that's why, that's why I just, it's hard for me to really talk about supplementation without having a lab and try to generalize it because I don't want anybody to watch the, this podcast or any podcast I'm on and run out and buy something without any justification. Because a lot of people take stuff and I'll look and say, well, let me see your labs that would help me at least dictate why you need to take that in the first place. Like, I don't have any done. I'm like, so yeah, yeah, there's nothing universal for your body then. If somebody can only afford to get one to two hormone tests done, mm -hmm. which one or two do you think it should be? What I would say is this, that would base if you're cyclic or, or if you're menopausal. Um, if you're cyclic, I'd want you to get Dutch test. And if you're menopausal, I'd want you to just get the blood work we had done. Okay. And I call it the thyroid hormones. Um, just because you're going to find out that most cyclic women um, don't have a lot of problems with production. Now, there are women that do so just in general, but you asked me about if, you know, for cost purposes that way, um, because therefore they have a lot of conversion problems. See, if you really look at your labs too, you have a lot of hormone conversion problems because the phase one and stuff of the liver that's going on with you, it's evident in your labs. Um, and then when you're, when you're more menopausal, you have a production problem because women, once again, their body has their ovaries start to change and now they get a lot of, based on their adrenals and the other production pro things. So therefore I want to see if they're just even making enough. Okay. So that's why you, if you want to divide them both up. And if somebody were to get all of the things, the gut microbiome, yep. the, the blood work, yep. the Dutch test, everything about how much does that cost somebody? I'd say probably could range from anywhere for a thousand to fifteen hundred bucks. Okay, and where are your wellness way clinics located? From Hawaii to U.S., which U.S. Um, have one in Ireland and more expanding. Um, they're all over. They're they're yeah yeah we have them all over. The best thing to do is go to the Wellness Way clinics or the Wellness dot com, and you can see we have a map of all of our clinics there and and all of our things. We have ones here in Phoenix. We have we have them everywhere. It's and and actually more pop up every single month.
So if somebody wants to go to the Wellness Way, what is, what is the process like? What can they expect? Um, no different than going to your doctor. You're going you're gonna to sit down and have a conversation with them. They're going to figure out what to do with you. Um, and they're going to figure out some labs to do with you that way. Come back, uh, come down, sit down, and kind of go over things with you. And Darren, like I said, just like you, you know, got your labs done. And if you notice, if you notice, I didn't ask much what was going on. Did you notice that? Yeah, you didn't. Because I don't really need to know. Because yeah, the labs told you everything. Thank you. <laughs> see, that's the thing. That, that's why, that, and see, that makes so much sense to people. Because once again, I'm like going, nope, here's what happens. At, at your age, I knew you never had had your hormones tested properly. And so therefore, I'm like going, if I just did that to start, it's going to direct me to a lot of uh, things to do. And so therefore, that's why I tell people, it's like, if you just start with the, that, it can it can put you in a wonderful direction and start to give you things to do that way. And, and, um, and so therefore you, but you know, my, my docs are trained extensively and they're going to go through and, and find some detail, then figure out what labs do with you, sit down, go over that thing, and then, then give you individualized what to do. And I will tell you this, it's my recommendations are hard. I want to make that very clear to everybody. My recommendations are hard. They really are just because they're so unconventional to what you've been trained your whole life. And because I want people to make such big lifestyle changes, that's, that's the thing, you know, even, even you, you used to talk about, it's like, oh, you can just hear the, the strain and the emotional stress behind it because you're asking people to change things that are very emotional to them. Remind everybody what your book is called and what you cover in it. Oh, well, my first book that became an international bestseller was called I Disagree. And, um, April 6th, we have my second book coming out. Now I've written a bunch more, but this is, these, these are ones that were made for the public and stuff. Um, it's called I Still Disagree. Oh, and what's this one? What do we look forward to in this? So it's there. It takes a lot of the first one and builds upon um, builds upon some major immune factors uh, that we talk about concerning things that you you're going through. Yeah, that's gonna be perfect for me. Yep, and also there is um, there is evidence of a person with because uh, I've dealt with this a lot um, HIV and also cancer. And so their journeys. And so I tell people this book is very similar to like a chicken soup for a soul, where the fact that it's like it's good stories of people that have been through things and their labs and their recovery and things like that. Like I told you about that we've talked about your labs extensively. I'm hoping after you see not only all the beautiful changes that you want to see, but then when you get your labs redone, and because they will tell you things can't change. And then you see them change, guess what happens? The evidence is is right there. Where can people find you on Instagram? Ah, uh, just Dr. Patrick Flynn. Um, but I will warn everybody, I've been kicked off of, I just recently got kicked off of TikTok for some reason. <laughs> no, are you serious? <laughs> yeah, and they let me back on, but the idea is this, I had a ton of followers and stuff like that. And Instagram blocks my account every once in a while and YouTube I've been kicked off twice. And and I'm, I'm sharing just this information that you can just go simply look up. Um, but because, because, um, <laughs> Because one of my main factors and that I deal with is immune system. Obviously, the last three years is what they really freaked out about the most, trying to give people good guidance on that. Because and, and I actually put a bunch of my predictions that were going to happen, um, knowing what they were trying to do in the first place, and they all came true. So, of course, that, um, yeah. But you can't negatively affect the body with some chemical and not predict these things happen. It's just, and then what I did is I proved it by labs. Well, so. I cannot thank you enough, Dr. Flynn, for helping me balance my own hormones. We're starting the journey. Yep. I'm so excited because now see what you're saying. We'll have to do another test again mm -hmm. in the future and then we'll we'll see how it all played out. Yep. I'm, I'm going to do what you say <laughs> so we can make sure that, you know, I'm giving yep. it a fair shot here. Yep. But um, I can't thank you enough for all this. I have, yeah, I've never done any of this before. And, and this is all part of my whole health and wellness journey that I'm on right now. I, I want to learn all this stuff and I want to make improvements. So, um, and I also know that you've changed so many of my listeners' lives. They would just be upset with me if I didn't thank you on behalf of them. I have gotten hundreds of messages and comments about you, you specifically and our first interview last July about how you totally changed their life, their marriage. Yep. They found out things that were wrong with them that nobody else had told them uh, from going to your clinic. So um, just thank you all around. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anne. And uh, for all you listeners before, I can't thank you enough for the wonderful podcast we had before and, and uh, looking to see how this one does. I know it's going to be wonderful for all the great things we did today. 
I hope this episode was the kick in the pants that you needed to finally get your hormones tested. So many of my symptoms I thought were just me things. Do you ever have that? Things you're like, well, that's just me. That's just me. Because you experience it every day for years. And that was happening to me. And so I thought it was just normal. But these labs proved that they weren't normal. And so now I am beginning my journey to balance my hormones. And I think it would be so cool for you to do it with me. And then we can share together how much our health improves this year. Next week, I'm doing an episode that I have wanted to do for so long, but I really held out for this guest. I just didn't want to do it if I couldn't get her. We are going to do the ultimate baby formula episode. Is there such a thing as healthier baby formula? What should a mother do if she's not producing milk? Why is baby formula one of the most controversial subsets of our food industry? She is the person that I first heard speak on this that alerted me to there even being a problem in this industry in the first place and fired me up. So I need you to make sure that you're actually subscribed to this podcast. You're not just searching for it weekly in your podcast app. That way you always see new episodes and are a alerted a new episode is there right away. Who knows? I'm so excited for this one next week. I might drop it early. Watch every episode by subscribing to Real Alex Clark on YouTube. Season six of The Spillover is shaping up already to be our best yet, and we're just getting started. If you didn't know, The Spillover is produced by Turning Point USA, a nonprofit. You can support the show financially, help pay for our guest travel, equipment, and more. Make a tax-deductible donation at the link in the description. New episodes come out every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. I'm Alex Clark, and this is The Spillover. Love you, mean it, bye! I just, I can't even tell you how much I love toast. I know. (laughs) You can just hear the the strain and the emotional stress behind it because you're asking people to change things that are very emotional to them. Like my toast. Mm -hmm. Like your toast. Yeah, because why, what is it about, um, what is the word I'm looking for? For, why am I, okay, I'm having a brain (laughs) burp. This is my brain burp. That's okay, I say, there you go. (laughs) That's good. (laughs) You're loud. <laughs>